uh, thanks again to the organizers for inviting me to speak. Um, I've made a small t change to the title of my talk because I realized I could write it as a haiku. And indeed today I'll be talking about refactoring the B factor, uh, the simple extraction of molecular motions out of disorder. Um, so I'm going to start with a brief description of static and dynamic disorder in macromolecular crystals. I'll then move on to uh, everyone's favorite crystallographic or model parameter B factors. Um, and then I'll describe a new hierarchical approach that we've um, developed for analyzing B factors of macromolecular structures uh, called ECHT. Um, we will, I'll, I'll show it on a couple of structures and I'll also show how we've applied it to ensemble refinement. Unfortunately, uh, given the time of the talk, I don't think I'll be able to uh, do it, show anything today on multiple data sets. Um, so that's a subject for another talk, I think. So to begin, disorder in macromolecular crystals. Um, as, as hopefully all of us know, crystals that we use uh, to collect data from are not perfectly repeating objects uh, and they contain imperfections, uh, depending on whether you want to call them imperfections. So some of these um, can kind of, to me, be described as static disorder, which I'm gonna broadly call crystal imperfections. And then we have potentially more interesting things like dynamic disorder, um, which is disorder in our crystal caused by things moving around. Um, there's some kind of uh, schematic things on the right-hand side. So in a perfect crystal, if you average over a, an object, you'll get basically exactly that object back. But as soon as you start to introduce kind of changes in the relative positions in the unit cells, you'll start to get a, a blurred object um, rather than a perfect representation. And for us, potentially more interesting, if something is moving around because everything is in a, in a potential, um, as everything starts to move around, that blurring starts to encode um, some of the dynamic information that we are interested in. And so therefore by modeling this blurring, hopefully eventually we'll be able to reveal uh, dynamics of those atoms. Some quick notes on B factors, which have been covered by uh, a couple of talks, I think, yesterday. Um, if you have a B factor with a positive value, they're, they're generally used for blurring. B factors with negative values can be considered to be sharpening, um, particularly when we're talking about matte blurring or sharpening in cryo -EM or crystallography, again, covered yesterday nicely. Um, of course, if we're talking about uh, atomic B factors, we can only have blurring of an atom. You cannot sharpen a, a, an atom, that, that doesn't make sense. Um, so therefore the use of B factors in our uh, atomic models allows our atoms to, to fit to blurry maps, which contain disorder. Um, another quick note for, for anyone's, well, I say interested. Um, the B, as far as I'm aware, does not actually mean anything. It does not mean blurring. Uh, I think it comes from an equation that had e, A, E to the minus B, X squared, I guess. Uh, and so therefore it's just the second parameter in an equation, hence the B. So atomic B factors in models. Um, and so as I've kind of mentioned, um, B factors in a model uh, kind of represent the blurring of an atom. So the, the atom isn't still, it's kind of moving around its, its average position. And our B factor models are Gaussian deviation from that um, position. A small B factor, a small mobility, a large B factor, a large mobility. Um, there, are, there are two types that we can use chiefly, certainly in macromolecular crystallography. There are, of course, more uh, if you go into chemical crystallography. Um, and these are the isotropic B factor where the disorder is modeled as a sphere. So that's a, a, a univariate Gaussian, the same in all directions. Uh, or an anisotropic B factor where the shape of the disorder is an ellipsoid. And now you can have variation in the, in the disorder of your atom. So for instance, one axis might have more kind of disorder or motion in it compared to the others where it's kind of just ping-ponging around. But it, you can imagine that the disorder of the atom is, is in the shape of an ellipsoid or a disk um, or anything. So there, there's a, um, uh, another way of describing disorder that is commonly used in macromolecular crystallography, and this is the, the TLS model of disorder. Um, TLS models are a really good way to generate a set of anisotropic B factors for an entire group of atoms. Um, this is very useful because it enables us to describe our data anisotropically and of course our atoms in our models are not moving isotropically most of the time. So therefore uh, an ability to generate anisotropic more detailed models using a smaller number of parameters is, is nicely favorable. Um, and the advantage of TLS models is that we can, we can define an arbitrary group of atoms and we can describe the rigid body motion of that group of atoms uh, generating anisotropic uh, disorder components for all of those atoms simultaneously using only 20 parameters per group. So this is a nice, yeah, a, a nice way to generate a, a, an anisotropic kind of arbitrary rigid body disorder motion 
for an entire group of atoms uh, for only 20 parameters. Um, there is, of course, one note. The, the current implementation of TLS refinement in some software um, can create valid B factors, meaning that they have positive values, but that they can't necessarily be decomposed into these rigid body motions, which is where the model comes from. Um, it's not a problem, it's just something to be noted that was uh, noted in a paper in 2015. Um, just to give an idea of the, the complexity of these models and kind of how they relate to each other, the, the simplest model we can pretty much have, um, or at least that I'm going to consider lower resolution is, is slightly even different, uh, is that you use only isotropic B factors in your model. Um, if you use an anisotropic B factor per atom, that's one, one parameter per atom over here on the left hand side. Um, every, every atom gets its own sphere. And at the other end, at high, high resolution, we have a, a very complex model with lots of detail um, where we have now six, ram six parameters per atom uh, and an anisotropic description of every atom. And then kind of floating in the middle is, is another commonly used model of TLS plus isotropic where people will define a TLS group, say one per chain, um, and use that to describe the anisotropic motion of that chain. And then on top of that, every atom gets its own B factor. Um, it, which can be different. And so this kind of gives you one plus a bit uh, parameters per atom depending on how large your TLS groups are. So it's in, it is important to notice that kind of there is therefore um, quite a large gap uh, often. I've kind of, this, this dotted line is obviously very vague because you can define your TLS parameters uh, any way you like, but there is actually normally a huge difference between the models we usually use, which are down here for medium resolution of um, kind of one and a bit parameters. And then there's a huge jump when you go to high resolution data and you start using anisotropic B factors for everything. And then of course, the, the question that I'm gonna be trying to address today, uh, how do you interpret B factors? Um, basically we don't, as far as I'm concerned, there are a few approaches out there, but um, to me, certainly none of them are particularly satisfactory. And the problem is that your low resolution structures on the one hand, uh, and this is a structure I, for fun, refined with anisotropic B factors, even though it's a three and a half angstrom structure. Do not do this. Um, you have low resolution structures, uh, which have large B factors, and you have high resolution structures, which have small B factors. These are very, very well defined, generally. These are generally quite poorly defined, and there are no real ways that can meaningfully compare between two arbitrary structures um, at, at different resolutions. So the model we, we, um, we developed and we kind of uh, are proposing today is a hierarchical disorder model, uh, which is a new approach to disorder modeling in crystallography. Um, when we go back and think about the uh, disorder that I've been talking about, we have a hierarchy of motions in our crystal. So we have a, a disorder component from the crystal itself, so from any lattice imperfections. We then also have um, your, your molecule is kind of rocking in the unit cell. Uh, and so these create kind of rigid body kind of molecular motions. And then you can also have sections of your protein down to the scale of side chains or even atoms that are moving independently. And these also create a disorder component that gets bundled in on top. So we have a hierarchy of motions, which all sum together. And so our proposal was, why don't we make a disorder model, which is a hierarchy of, of, of components, which all sum together. Um, for simplicity, the, the model we've chosen to use is TLS, so these are all now rigid body components, although those of course are potentially a good first approximation to the mo models that we see in a crystal. And so we have, you can now define an arbitrary, uh, an arbitrary hierarchy of, of motions and disorder components in your crystal. So starting for instance at the bottom here with one TLS group per chain to describe molecular motion, you can then add a group per secondary structure, you can add a group per residue, and even then start to go down to the levels of backbone and side chain motions, uh, disorder at least, not necessarily motion, I should say. Uh, and then of course you have an atomic component to stick it in on top. Um, so this we call the Echt b fact model, which is of course a joke because Echt means real in German or Dutch, uh, and is the extensible component hierarchical TLS. And so we can use this for structural analysis to try and uh, identify any hierarchical di disorder components in a, in a macro macromolecular model. Um, and we can, we can, what we can do is we can take this model and fit it against a refined 
crystallographic or cryo-EM structure. Um, it's flexible, you can apply it to both isotropic or anisotropic atoms, um, isotropically refined atoms, I should say, um, and we use a TLS optimization procedure that ensures that it's, it's valid using the validation procedure proposed by Ozumchev 2015. Unfortunately, things aren't so simple. This model is degenerate because you can take out a lower level, add that component to a higher level and get exactly the same output. So what we need to use is a statistical approach to ensure that we get the parsimonious model, i.e. the simplest model that we can get that explains the disorder using kind of the smallest number of components. And so we use elastic net, which is a very nice way to kind of force it to adopt a simpler model and then to relax it into a more complex model. So we begin, as I've, as I've just said, by using kind of strict restraints on this elastic net model, and that forces a lot of B factor into the lower levels of your, of your hierarchy. So the, the graph to the right shows that at the beginning we use strong restraints and it forces a lot into this green bar, which is the chain component of our disorder model. And then as we gradually relax it, that chain goes away because other, mo other, um, other components of the model are picking up more of the detail in the refined B factors, and eventually kind of actually the, the chain drops pretty low and you can, um, you can th this gives you the parsimonious B factor model. So this is the simplest model that describes all of the disorder in the structure. So I'll show you now a couple of examples. Um, this is a cryo-EM structure uh, solved at 3.1 angstrom, roughly. Um, it was actually refined with group B factors. So I didn't mention these at the beginning, but this is when you have for every residue, you give it one isotropic B factor, the same one to every atom in the residue. Uh, this is a, um, a reducing protein, so it takes an, an ADPH that binds here and transfers an electron to reduce iron 3 to iron 2 um, extracellularly for uptake, I believe. So uh, this, this, this structure, um, once you run it, you, you kind of uh, can decompose the disorder into uh, separate kind of components. So you pick up um, a, a quite large kind of 50 to 60 angstrom squared disorder component for the actual whole molecule. So this bottom level has one group defined for the whole molecule. Um, it is a, uh, a, tr a domain swap trimer. So I defined another level called cap or membrane where we have one group now for the uh, membrane uh, component of the trimer and one group for the three uh, intracellular domains of the trimer. And then at the next level domain, we have now one group for each intracellular domain of the trimer and one for each membrane group of the trimer. And so you can, you can break down the disorder at different levels and, and see where the disorder in this structure kind of settles um, from, from our model. And so to, to show you what this looks like, we can, we can split up the disorder in the refined structure. You see that, as I said, there's a large component in the trimer. And then when we split it into the, the membrane and the cap section, you pick up another one. So the kind of the cap is um, at least compatible with kind of some form of group motion. It is certainly more disordered than the membrane component. And then you can, um, if, you, if you wish, kind of split down separately. And so I've defined one for each now uh, membrane and intracellular component of, the, of the, each chain of the trimer. And then you can go even further and use a secondary structure um, annotation algorithm to define secondary structure groups um, and pick up some kind of intra-chain disorder, flexibility, motions, whatever they turn out to be. And this is actually quite interesting because what the secondary structure um, does, and I've rescaled the B factors so you can see them and recolored them so you can see atom types. Um, so these are the refined B factors um, for the structure and you can't really see very much at all. But when you decompose it and look at the secondary structure disorder, you actually see that this loop on the side of the protein is very, very flexible. And this actually, actually I think, suggests a mechanism for electron transport because it's unclear how the electron jumps from the NADP to the FAD molecule. And if this opens and kind of shuttles the FAD out of the binding site, enabling it to pick it up before it snaps down and the electron can jump across to the heme molecule. Next Another protein that I'm sure... Minute. Another protein I'm sure everyone's uh, intimately uh, familiar with by now is the spike protein. So like everyone this year, I ran my program on the spike protein. And in this one, it has one of the RBDs of the trimer extended. Uh, and this kind of nicely demonstrates and it picks up um, that this domain is unsurprisingly flexible since it's in an extended uh, conformation, but also finds that in the trimer, the two that are still folded down, 
the, the C one seems to be more flexible and therefore kind of potentially more likely to be the next one of this trimer to pop up. Um, so the last thing, very, very quickly, uh, we've also applied this to ensemble refinement. So ensemble refinement runs a molecular dynamics simulation against crystallographic data. Unfortunately, to get it to work, you need a disorder component because it's crystallography. Um, the current approach isn't great because it fits to the C alphas, sorry, because it fits to the C alphas of the model and you therefore end up with a disorder component that's kind of too large. Uh, the ECHT model allows us to choose how much disorder we want to put into the disorder and how much we want to be reflected in the MD simulation. Um, and this enables us to tune the, the simulations and prevent what is an artifact of the original disorder model where you end up with these atoms that do not move in an MD simulation, which is very strange. And by choosing our disorder model, we can now fine tune how much we want to be reflected in the MD. Um, so in conclusion, I've presented what I hope is going to be a useful tool for disorder map analysis in macroelectular structures. Um, it's generally applicable. The model is completely flexible and kind of expansible. Um, but it, because it breaks everything down into interpretable components, it should enable comparison between arbitrary structures now. Um, and hopefully to, to applications such as ensemble refinement to create more realistic simulations, and I haven't had time to talk about it, but there's also applications to multi data set refinement. Um, implementation availability, I can go through in the Q&A section, but just to thank my supervisor at my previous university, Peter Cross, and to funding from the EMBO Fellowship and my current VME Fellowship. Thank you very much. <laughs>